that was better than one can usually hope for at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> this not being Paris. Um, why did you, when you look back now on, on this uh, career of magic, debunking, uh, gelding, disempowering, voodoo, creating zoomorphs, therianthropes, and all the rest of it. Are you surprised that this is what you ended up doing? I mean, what, what point in the trajectory of Rosen do we begin to pick out the future? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, that it's almost like a Star Wars moment. Um, I realised that I wanted my destiny to be when I was 10, when I picked up my sister's history school, uh, school history textbook, which was the history of Britain 1780 to 1950, published 1953. And it was illustrated throughout with cartoons, as lazy historians do, because these are actually a short circuit into, into history. And um, it was full of all these gilrays and tenules and lows, and I thought, these are just fantastic. I was, I was interested in politics, I, was, I could draw. And something clicked in me, and I thought, this is just extraordinary, what these things do. And I then found some old steel nibs in my father's desk, and I started trying to draw like Gilray etched. And it was no looking back from there on, because you went to Cambridge, and you I had an orthodox yeah. academic yeah. career, but you... The die was cast. At, at this is what 10. I wanted to do, and I was lucky in being able to... I mean, after I graduated, albeit with a very bad degree, because I spent most of my time drawing, um, I, I then launched straight into it. I had never had a proper job, thank God. Um, you made a very eloquent uh, series of points. I, I was interested by what you said about the, the attitude of politicians towards... Uh, cartoon and towards caricature, given what you're trying to do. And there seem to be two paradigms there, or three paradigms. One is that the politician ignores it completely. It's just a brickbat. We don't mind. The other is that the politician in some way tries to uh, render null the voodoo by purchasing the cartoon and putting it in the toilet. And the sort of third way exemplified by Anne Widdicombe seems to be a kind of Rolling with the punch, a kind yeah. of jolly. But well, there, there is a fourth way. Yeah, well, what's the fourth way? Well, the fourth way is when they actually let it affect them, which is the human thing to do. I mean, I've been drawn by fellow cartoonists at cartoon festivals, and I find it deeply transgressive. I don't like it. Mm. Um, you know, I look like Harrison Ford, and they don't seem to think this, but, which is very disturbing. Um, well, you look like Harrison Ford does now. Yeah, that's the <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, But, you know, this, this is one of the reasons why. John Major had such an unhappy time when he was Prime Minister that he minded. And he was once asked about the way Steve Bell portrayed him in his underpants, and he should have said, oh, yes, it's jolly good fun. Ha, ha, ha. Because that's the penalty they have to pay. That's what they have to pay back to us to withstand this torrent and barrage of, of abuse. Uh, but instead, he said, it is merely an attempt to destabilise my government. <laughs> and I ignore it, by which you knew that he didn't ignore it, that he looked at it obsessively and hated it. So, um, in 1997, I was at um, soon to be the late lamented Tribune's 60th birthday party in Brown's restaurant in St. Martin's Lane. And um, having just been buttonholed by Ed Balls, I managed to escape him and, and bumped into Gordon Brown and, uh, and Sarah, then not his wife, uh, and introduced myself. I'd having met Brown before and said, Look, um, I've just been buttonholed by your monkey Balls, who's been talking complete rubbish now, you know, you've got to remember that economics is an art, not a science, forget all this endogenous growth theory crap. Sublimate it to your politics, ameliorate the condition of the poor, otherwise you have no right to the title of a Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer. I was a bit pissed, I should say, but, you know, I, was, I thought it was not an unreasonable thing to say. I'm a, I'm a voter as well as a cartoonist. And he uh, looked at me and he went, why do you always draw me so fat? <laughs> <laughs> Which um, he should never have said. He should have said... Um, Oh uh, yes, I love your stuff, even if he didn't, because... That's Have you been making him progressively fatter ever yeah, since yeah, he yeah, said yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but is there not possibly even a fifth way, which is I know that our mutual friend uh, Ralph Steadman uh, declines to draw politicians any longer on the basis that they are in fact insufferably vain. Oh yeah. And yeah. he takes their buying his cartoons and hanging them in their toilet. Maybe it is a primitive act of trying to 
debunk and, and deflect the attack, but Ralph also sees it as, as pure vanity. That they oh, don't I mean, no, it, it is pure vanity. I mean, the, my, my, my great inspiration, Gilray, uh, was being badgered by George Canning and his agents for months and months and months in the 1790s to put Canning into one of Gilray's satirical etchings because it would prove that he had arrived. And one thing worse for a cartoonist than being, uh, for a politician than being drawn by a cartoonist is not being drawn by a cartoonist because it means you're not sufficiently interesting or memorable to appear visually without mm. having John Hutton written on front of him. Yeah, but it, it struck me that, in fact, the more extreme, I mean, looking at, I think, you know, what's notable about your work is a, you're a rather brilliant colourist as well as a, uh, your line, your colour's very good, and when you go into full colour, and when you actually go even beyond zoomorphs, beyond therianthropes, and start turning people into boats or cars or things like that, that that is um, taking it to a whole different level. I mean, is it what, in other words, is there any limit to what you can do with caricature in that sense? Is it, can it just become more and more Baroque and involved? I think it become more and more Baroque and involved in all sorts of strange ways. Uh, it was never published uh, because of the nature of the medium I was using, but about two years ago I, I found myself sitting on a high table in Trinity Hall in Cambridge, sitting opposite uh, an entomologist who spends most of his time up trees in the Amazon tweaking out beetles from the bark. And he couldn't understand what I did at all. I mean, it just it completely incomprehensible to him. And during the cheese course, I took some bits of cheese and a couple of biscuits and a side plate and did some stuff on it and said, who's that? And he said, it's Tony Blair. Oh. Um, because you can do, because I say, you reduce them down to symbols. So in a sense, the, the key power of, of the caricaturist in particular exists when it's most liminal. Yeah. So yeah. the aim, it's coming back to what you said about Mickey Mouse, the aim is to reduce to the component parts. And if you can get it, you're really breaking down yeah. the image in, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, it's sort of, it, it is extreme deconstruction, but without gelignite. Mm. Now, to what extent do you think that, I mean, it's a difficult question for you to answer because you're you, but to what, it, I think some people might imagine that it would be potentially useful for a satirist to be non-partisan, but you make no real secret of where you stand in the political spectrum. Do you think that affects well, your work? Well, it, it depends precisely what I am um, as a satirist. If my job is to satirise everybody, which I think it probably is, but, it's also, but, uh, but the way I've actually pursued being a satirist is by being a visual journalist. Mm. And as the Independent found out in its early days, if you had reasonable non-partisan columnists who were trying to seek the middle path, nobody would read them. But you need to have a point of view. You mm. need to be saying something. You can't just, well, I mean, you can, but it's doesn't, it doesn't last very long just go the Prime Minister's a twit over and over and over again. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I and my colleagues are always, always accused of being cynical. But we're not. We're sceptical, as most people should be. And... Um, there isn't a political party in this country at the moment which fully coalesces with my political ambitions, which would sort of probably be described as kind of William Morris socialist and therefore utopian and totally unrealisable. But uh, wallpaper, really. Yeah, wallpaper. <laughs> Redemption through wallpaper. <laughs> you see, if those bankers had just been making wallpaper, doing Ruskinian useful labour as opposed to useless toil, we wouldn't be in the mess we are now. You, you kicked off by talking about um, Alistair Campbell and about his, his reaction to, to your drawing in the Gay Hussar. Um, do you worry about meeting the people you caricature, not because of their immediate reaction to the fact that you've drawn them, but because in some sense there's a danger of, of being chummy, in a way? I mean, you're talking about being friendly with Anne Widdicombe. Would that compromise your ability to be as savage about her as you might choose well, to Well, I, I don't think it does, and I don't think it should, because... If they're sensible, like Widdicombe, they will recognise that it's part of a game. Said it's, it's as ritualised as no theatre. We've been doing this for 300 years in this country. We've been doing it in a tolerated way for 300 years. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Can I stop you there? But if it's as ritualised as no theatre and it's part of a game, then in what sense can it have real torsion? Do you see what I mean? Oh, well, surely I mean, I don't, I don't surely you've succeeded as a, as a cartoonist when a politician actually won't talk to you. Or... But I'm dealing with... I'm dealing with people who have actually uh, placed something on top of their humanity as individual people. They, are, they become symbols because of what they do. Mm. And I'm I mean, it's like you know, saluting the uniform and not the man inside it. It's like meeting a V sign at the uniform and not the man inside it. Mm. Um, 
another sort of brief anecdote. The one time I've been invited to number 10 Downing Street was on the occasion of Michael Foote's 90th birthday. And uh, my wife and I were standing there on the edge of the lawn, and Tony Blair bounced up to us, and he said hi, and we said hi back, and talked about where he bought his tie from. And they had Pringles, actually. It was very nice, very nice evening. Pringles? Awesome. Pringles, Pringles that and big sucks. strawberries. sucks. Yeah, anyway. Well, imagine being that powerful and having Pringles. I know, I know. I'd have cheese footballs. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but two days later, Footy had another leg of his great 90th birthday celebrations in the Gay Who's Are, and Peter Hain came up to me and said, and because that mor the morning of the day we were at number 10, I'd done this cartoon for The Guardian called The Stages of Intelligence Failure, showing Blair going through 12 frames of mania, delusion, psychotic interlude, and things like that. Um, and Haynes said, I don't know how you dared stand on that man's lawn and enjoy his hospitality. It didn't quite say his Pringles, but you knew he wanted to. <laughs> um, when you produce that disgraceful cartoon. And I then sort of said to him, it's like the end of The Godfather, when the guy's being taken out to be shot in the back of the head and says, tell Michael I always liked him. Yes, he knows this is just business. So could we flip it around the other way and say the index of the tolerance and openness of a society, despite the obvious abuses of power that may take place, is its willingness to put up with this. In other words, yeah. your presence on the lawn at number 10 after doing that cartoon yeah. is a healthy Yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think it is healthy because it means that people like me are not in danger uh, some way down the line of being tortured to death in a dungeon. Mm. Um, it's, it's a very telling story, again, to go back into the history of cartoons, uh, about the French ambassador at the court of St. James in, I think, 1787, sending a diplomatic message back to Versailles, saying, this country is on the verge of a revolution. It is unbelievable. The stuff you can buy in the streets, you can openly buy these appalling and disgusting and degrading cartoons of the royal family. This place is doomed. And of course, he was absolutely and completely wrong, because the same stuff was appearing in France, but it was Samistat, it was underground. And it was part of the pressure cooker, which then exploded. So if you want to live in a reasonably liberal, reasonably tolerant society, you need to tolerate stuff like this. I'm going to open it up in a minute. I just wanted to ask you one more question, and I don't Well, I'll, I'll put it straight. Is there anything for you that is off limits? Um, well, obviously, yes. There are lots of things that are off limits. It's, as I was implying, the difference between public and private discourse, uh, that at the time of the death of uh, Princess Diana, all these people emoting in the streets, at the same time in private, they were telling the most appalling jokes about her death. Same people doing the same thing. You know, wear many different hats. And I don't do racism, I don't do sexism. Um, I d essentially, what I don't do is, is to break uh, that wonderful definition of journalism by H.L. Mencken, which is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Mm. I don't attack people less powerful than me. Is there any time when you look back on your career when you have any regrets? On it? I've, I've had a few regrets when cartoons of mine have been misinterpreted. Mm. Um, and People have been offended who I was not seeking to offend. Mm. Um, and that's, that's happened a couple of times. Uh, mostly the regrets are that I was foolish enough to discuss the idea with a comment editor, and they vetoed it before it hit the page. And the one I regret most of all was when the House of Lords was voting on the repeal of Clause 28. And I was going to have two members of the House of Lords and the urinals of the House of Lords one saying to the other one, fancy a quick no job. <laughs> uh, and I was told, this is a family newspaper, we can't possibly run that. But of course, had I not discussed it and just filed it late, they would have run it because they f fear a blank space more than they fear a bad joke. <laughs> Thank you, Martin.